see, this is a Galaxy Note 4 phone. And basically what you'll see when you put your head in here, it'll take a second for it to recognize your head signal. Normally you put a strap on and so on. If you notice on the side here, there's a pad. If, it, if the footage that you're seeing stops, just tap it, okay? And basically what you're in is a spherical video world of, um, in Iceland. So, pass it around and move your head around. Don't, uh, don't just look at it like that. <laughs> at the same time maintaining our civilian work. So, that's us, that was the building you just saw. These are folks that are involved in our group, an interdisciplinary group. Uh, I'm a psychologist, clinical psychologist. We've got uh, occupational therapy, we've got a, a doctor involved, we've got a whole variety of folks with technical expertise uh, that help us put, as a team, everything together. And over the years, we've evolved applications in psychological apps, cognitive, motor, and virtual humans. And I'll show a little bit of the video of some of the stuff. Get some kind of rich. So this is what you'll see in a minute. This is a virtual reality simulation of an Iraq or an Afghan city, an alleyway. And it's part of what we use for treating PTSD, where we conduct what's called virtual reality exposure therapy. Traditional exposure therapy, but done using virtual reality. You get to see it. We also use it for teaching people emotional coping skills before they go into combat. So, so do you kind of use it in a way like ERP? Is that pretty much what it is? Like systematic desensitization? Well, uh, with, uh, with exposure, right. we follow the prolonged exposure model, which is graduated exposure to the things that you fear or that are anxiety provoking, uh, but helping the patient to feel that anxiety. Right. And eventually it'll extinguish. With systematic desensitization, it's a different process. It's right. the idea of teaching someone to relax in the face of these things. And some groups have actually tried that with VR. Uh, the downside is it takes a little bit longer for people to master that skill of relaxation in the context of a threatening stimuli. 
takes 20, 25 sessions of work Brenda Wiederhold had, had done on San Diego. Ours is a little bit quicker. Right, okay. um, so this is what that system looks like. About five years ago, um, this is uh, something where we took the simulation we created and decided to build a series of cognitive tests, tests of attention, memory, executive function, within a military relevant context. We're in a headset, you navigate, and you have to pay attention to things and be vigilant, and you have different tasks. And it was a way to test those types of cognitive functions, but in a relevant environment for the military. Um, but we've done civilian stuff. This is uh, some older work uh, with mental rotation, visual spatial abilities, manipulating blocks, and turning objects over in your head and making decisions. Um, and here's one with a virtual classroom we developed for kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, not as a treatment, but as an assessment tool, where that's what the child sees wearing a headset as they turn their head and look around. They have to pay attention on the board to the stimuli, but meanwhile, knock on the door, the teacher goes over there, the kid just threw a paper airplane, the little girl turns her head, and you look over there and you see a bus. So the idea there is like an aircraft simulator with test and train piloting ability, we have a classroom simulator. So you can put somebody in a real context that challenges their attentional skills and systematically control distraction. And so in the cognitive area, um, we've done a, a, a few of these things and I think there's been more to come. Uh, my belief is, all, this is how I got started in, in working in VR in the 90s was from my clinical training in rehab. Um, I saw that we needed to put people in realistic environments, um, and that would be the optimal context in which to test and train performance and rehabilitate brain function, where there's a context that might help whatever is learned in the simulation make it so that that's, that's more readily transferable. I don't think that stuff is so bad, um, but it's you know I don't I don't know how much if there's really been solid research to show that doing you know decontextualized tasks in mass that actually transfers to better performance in everyday life. I hope it does. I'm not the research is there yet. Huh? You gotta wait a second. Hold it on your head and it'll pop back up. Okay. And finally, and you'll see this stuff in a little bit. Using a Microsoft Connect to track the user's motor movement. Um, trying to embed very boring, repetitive rehab type tasks for motor function into a game like context. And using off the shelf stuff that people can have in their home. So maybe we can start pushing more rehab activities into the home, monitor it through a connection, and so on. Uh, so that's pretty intuitive. You'll see that, so I'll spend more time. Next, you'll see a demo for the USC standard patient, but it derived from a virtual patient project. Social worker at USC talking well, to a service member, virtual patient. She's been pretty concerned about me since they sold you some sort of business. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He was a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up on camp. So, essentially, in a nutshell, because you'll see this. Thank you. 
mentality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time, so hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. Okay, so with that, Mayor Dishida, Julia Campbell. Hello, we're going to go right out.